Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on Christian education. This is number eight, or lesson eight of that series, entitled Education and Redemption, and it's the lesson for November 21 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now as we contemplate this very important subject of Christian education. No matter where it happens, in the home, at school, or in gatherings when we might come together, Christian education is such an essential thing for, for all of us to be a part of. May that be true of each one of us, and may it be helped by what we study today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How would you summarize God's thousands of years of interaction with his people? Was it like a love story gone bad? Or like a father with a group of rebellious children? Or a teacher whose students seemed to fail every test? Of course, we know that what the final result will be, God, despite all of that, has won the great controversy. In this lesson, we will suggest that the Bible story is an invitation to learn about God through his interaction with the human race. In fact, we've been told repeatedly that Jesus came to this earth primarily to teach us the truth about God. So what was God's original intention for us? Remember Genesis 1, 26 and 27? You probably memorized this at some point if you had some Christian education. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. Good News Bible translation. So God started out with a perfect world, a perfect garden, and a perfect pair. But we know that very quickly things turned bad. Cain, their very first son, killed his brother Abel. Mm. I mean, it's hard to imagine how things could have de deteriorated so quickly. And by the way, what was the, what was the argument between Cain and Abel? Yes, how to worship God. Yes, the sacrifice. Man. One was part of a lamb or whatever, and the other one, he brought his pumpkins and uh, bananas in Yeah. There. So what does it mean to say that God made man in his own image? Does it mean that we look like God? Does it mean that we have freedom of choice? Does it mean that we are more like God than the other creatures on this earth? Are we supposed to be more like God intellectually, spiritually, physically? What was God's plan for us? What is his plan now that we have messed up? Jim, I think you have some ideas about that. To restore man, excuse me, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized, this was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator, individuality, power to think, and to do. Men, excuse me, the men to whom this power is, de is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, who influence character. It is the work of true education to develop this power to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. Instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let students be directed to the source of truth, to the vast fields opened for research in search of, excuse me, in nature and revelation. Let them con contemplate the great facts of duty and destiny, and the mind will be expanded and strengthened. Instead of educated weaklings, Institutions of learning may send forth men strong to think and to act, men who are masters 
and not slaves of circumstances, men who possess breadth of mind, clearness of thought, and the courage of their convictions. Okay, so those passages come from education, starting with page 15 and ending with page 17. And that the title of the lesson is Education Redemption. I think there's a text or a passage, he says, education is redemption, or redemption is education. And what is the duty of the parent is to educate the kids, teach the yep, kids. Right. Yep. How are we supposed to atta attain such a lofty goal? God has not left us alone to accomplish this task on our own. He offers us the help of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, God's goal is to get us to think and act like Jesus Christ. The story of redemption begins with a promise in Genesis 3.15, comes down to the story of Jesus Christ and the Incarnation, and will proceed to a re-creation at the third coming. So where are we in, all that, scheme, in that scheme of all of things? Heaven is a school, its field of study, the universe, its teacher, the Infinite One. A branch of this school was established in Eden, and the plan of redemption accomplished. Education will again be taken up in the e Eden School. It comes from E.G. White, Education, page 301, paragraph 1. Here must begin that study which shall be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In the light of the cross alone can the true value of human soul be estimated. Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 273, paragraph 1. Okay, so notice that this, to all eternity, sometimes people, I hear people desp despairing because they don't fully understand the plan of salvation. They don't understand every detail of the Bible. Da, da, da. Look, folks, we're going to be studying this for the rest of eternity. That doesn't mean we should be slacking now, but there is so much depth to the Bible and so much depth to the writings of Ellen White and to God's plans so that what you find is the deeper you study, the more there is to learn. So don't panic if you don't understand it all. Well, we have many titles that we apply to Jesus Christ, such as Son of God, Messiah, the Son of Man, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Lord, the Lamb of God. The people who knew him best when he was here on this earth, called him master or rabbi, both of which mean teacher. And almost everything Jesus did, whether it was healing or preaching or teaching, the ultimate goal was to teach some important letter, letter, lesson. Sorry. Notice what Isaiah said about him more than 700 years before he was born. I'm going to read from Isaiah 11, 1 to 4 and verses 9. The royal line of David is like a tree that has been cut down. But just as new branches sprout from a stump, so a new king will arise from among David's descendants. The Spirit of the Lord will give him wisdom and the knowledge and skill to rule his people. He will know the Lord's will and honor him and find pleasure in obeying him. He will not judge by appearance or hearsay. He will judge the poor fairly and defend the rights of the helpless. And then dropping down to verse 9, the key, I think, to the whole passage. On Zion, God's sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. Why not? The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. So, how does, if, if all the people there are full of the knowledge of the Lord, how, is it, how does it impact them? Won't, I mean, if everybody's, this is well, what they're full of. And what was it, John, was it John 17, 3? Eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ to whom he has sent. Yep. If you want to live forever, that's the recipe. Notice that in this beautiful prediction of what heaven and the new earth will be like, the focus is on how it will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. So the better we get to know God, what happens to us? By beholding, we become changed? changed. Yep. That kind of knowledge requires an excellent education. Our Savior, our teacher, wants to bring us knowledge, counsel, wisdom, and understanding. It says our Savior and teacher. The Savior is healer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, we're going to... Uh, 
in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. There you go. For in education, as in redemption, other foundation can no, excuse me, can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It was the good pleasure of the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Another way of saying that, in Jesus was fully God. Mm -hmm. Is that another way of saying that? Yeah. That's from Education, page 30, paragraph 2. And of course, it's from 1 Corinthians 3.11 and Colossians 1.19. The story of Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus in that nighttime vision, visit, fairly, and why did he come to Jesus at night? So he, can, he didn't want anybody else to know where he'd been. Where, or, or, or you know, he wouldn't want to influence anyone else to go and to this Jesus. I mean, he, he was concerned with his own reputation. Can't be too was. sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. He was he was standing in his among his peers, so called. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a familiar story found in John three. There, Jesus stated an interesting fact. Carrie? There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night he went to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. Notice it says, we know. Is he talking about himself or is he talking about I think there are the Sanhedrin? Here and there, probably. Okay. Uh, no one could perform the miracles you are doing unless God were with him. Jesus answered, I am telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. He got right to him, didn't he? First of all, notice that this Pharisee referred, Jesus, referred to Jesus as, as rabbi or teacher. Yeah. And he recognized that God was with him. Jesus did not waste any time, but immediately started talking about telling the truth. Yeah. How can we pick up the baton that Jesus laid down in that conversation recorded in John 3 and carry the message to the world? There should not be any question about the fact that the Bible is our textbook for learning about God. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Now, this would be Paul, almost at the very end of his life. He's in Roman prison, uh, waiting to be beheaded, basically. Uh, and he's writing to his, his son in the gospel, Timothy. But as for you, continue in the truths that you were taught and firmly believe. You know who your teachers were. And, and by the way, elsewhere he said his teachers were his mother and his grandmother, right? You know who your teachers were, and you remember that ever since you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and, and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting false, giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Well, we ought to point out, though, that there's a different way of translating that. Yes. Yeah. All scripture that is inspired by God is, yeah. is useful or profitable. So. Yeah. That is in there is, is, has to be supplied. You, what it said, the Greek says literally all scripture inspired by God, useful. And you have to decide where to put the is's in. And the question is, scripture just meant writing. Yeah. Just because something was written down doesn't mean it's a, it's a value. Yeah. Well, the Hebrew Bible, which Christians call the Old Testament, is divided into three parts. Those three parts are described as, and this would be in the New Testament, described as the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. The first five books of Moses are known as the Law or the Torah. These five books are, are intended not just to lay down God's rules, but also to teach us a great deal about wh what he wants of us. The next section in the Hebrew Bible, known as the Prophets, consists of the former prophets, which are the historical books from Joshua through 2 Chronicles, and the latter prophets, most of the books from Isaiah to Malachi, talking about what should have, they should have learned from the earlier scriptures. And I've, I've made it easy, I've sort of mixed these up a little bit. Uh, if you actually go to the Hebrew Bible, 
first and second chronicles are in the in the thing and in, in, in the last section and so forth like this but that gives you a rough idea the remaining part of the Old Testament called the writings consists largely of poetry and talks about some successful and some less successful teachers and students some of the better examples of educational successes would include Esther Ruth Daniel and Job among some of the clear failures in learning the truth about God were Job's four friends. You think they ever got the message? I don't know. <laughs> You're talking about uh, Job's friends? Yeah. yeah. We don't have any record, but uh, how many people? Here, the oldest book in the Bible, right? We, we agree that, that it was probably it the first book that, that... Genesis and Job were written by about the same time by Moses back right. down there when he was out sure herding sheep. And then, and we don't find out that uh, these friends were not telling the truth about God. It's almost like a foot, it is part of the epilogue, they call yeah. it, or, uh, I don't even, uh, what, uh, anybody ever ask what were the lies that were being told by the friends of Job? Yeah. And I uh, went through that, and I come to the conclusion, God punishes and God destroys. Those are the lies told, I mean. by, uh, told by the friends of Job. Well, he punishes you because you obviously are a sinner. Well, yeah. Well, look at yourself. I mean, yeah. that, that, but that's a whole theology today. Yeah. Nothing's new. You know, if your health is good, God's smiling on you, and your and your finances are good, God's smiling on you. And the flip side is, huh, you, you must have offended God. Yeah. Look at you. <clears throat> the Psalms is a hymn book. It is also it also has a lot of educational portions, particularly Psalm one. Psalm 37 and Psalm 73, if you want to have a look. The Gospels tell us the stories of the life of Jesus and abound with educational materials. Particularly appropriate are the parables of Jesus. Think about how much, I mean, how many sermons have you heard on the parables of Jesus? Probably hundreds, at least hundreds, right? Yeah. So obviously, I mean, there are many, many lessons that can be drawn out of those parables. Many of Paul's letters are full of educational material, including practical lessons about daily life. Even the book of Revelation is full of educational material. Jim? Revelation 5, 1 to 5. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It was covered with writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel who announced in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But there was one, excuse me, there was no one in heaven or on earth or in the world below who could open the scroll and look inside it. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. This experience, this thing happens in the very throne room of God. Are we suggesting that not even God himself can open this scroll? Why would this... I mean, what is there about this scroll that maybe God, not even God himself could open? Or was he choosing just not to do it because it needs to teach something? Well, let's see what we can find out. Yeah. Go ahead. Verse 4, I cried bitterly because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the little elders said to me, Don't cry, look. The lion from Judah's tribe, the great descendant of David, has won the victory, and he can break the seals and open the scroll. Good news Bible. Thus the Jewish leaders... So now we're, gonna, we're moving now from Bible, which you've been reading. Okay, okay. Now we're going to read a couple of comments from Ellen White about those scroll, that scroll. Thus the Jewish, Jewish leaders made their choice. Their decision was registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne. The book, which no man could open, it, excuse me, in all its vindic vindictiveness, th this decision w will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Ellen White, Christ's Ob Object Lessons, page 294. Okay, another comment? The book with seven seals contains the history of the world. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? 
and to open and to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven, nor on earth, no in earth, excuse me, nor in earth, neither the under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look therein. Revelation five one to three. There in his open hand lay the book, the roll of the history of God's providences, the prophet, the, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his law, laws, the holy symbolic, the whole, symbol. the whole symbolic council of the earth, and the history the of the eternal, his law, the whole symbolic council of the eternal, the history of all ruling powers in the nations, in symbolic language was contained in all, excuse me, in that role, the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. Ellen White Manuscript Release, Volumes 9, 7, or could be, page, I guess. Volume 9, page 7, seven verses one, 1 and 2. I mean, uh, chapter, uh, verses 1, uh, uh, paragraphs one, 1 and 2, yeah. That's an amazing statement. I don't know why it's not found in other places. In other words, that scroll that appears there, in the, and it's a, it's a key section in the book of Revelation, an absolute key section in the book of Revelation. And here, she tells us exactly what that scroll was all about. And why isn't it more w widely known? Well, so in other words, so now let's think about why only Jesus could open, open that scroll. If this is the history of our world, and this history of God's dealing with sin, who is the one who clearly spelled that all out for us through his life and his death? Christ. He was teaching all along. Yeah. There he is. Yes. So that's the way, and th that's a sense in which he's the one who was able to open the scroll. We said earlier on that the, the earth, it was, this earth was to educate men, but it was really also to educate all of God's intelligent We've creatures. We've talked about that in our previous lesson, yeah. yeah. So it is clear that there is a very careful record being kept in the very throne room of heaven of every event in every person's life from the days of Adam to the final events leading up to the second coming. One very sad section in the book of Deuteronomy is found in Deuteronomy 14, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. Kerry? After you have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is going to give you, and have settled there, then you will decide you need a king like all the nations round you. Make sure that the man you choose to be king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. So let's think about this for a minute. What's it saying? If you choose a king, it should be the one the Lord has chosen. So who's, done, who's doing the initial choosing? Why is it God's going to do it for him? Looks like God should be the one who's doing it for him, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. He must be one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army, and he is not to send people to Egypt to buy horses, because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. Okay, what king do you know of that married an Egyptian princess and brought a lot of horses from? Solomon, wasn't it? Solomon. Solomon. Okay, read on. Look what happens next. The king is not to have many wives because this would make him turn away from the Lord and he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. And who did all of that? Solomon. He did. Solomon. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. Wow. Good news Bible. I'm wondering how, 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 I bet he didn't read much of it, any of it. How, how, how many of the kings from either Judah or Israel actually followed that advice? How many of the judges before them? 
was boy was it till Hezekiah finally well, well the judges too. You know? Okay, it's let me just explain this. If you go to the northern kingdom, there was not a single good king in the northern kingdom, not one. No, no, no. And the southern kingdom, there were three or four: Hezekiah, Josiah, uh, Jehoshaphat. Uh, there were there were a few, but it's pretty pretty sad story. Very sad story. Imagine how different the history of the children of Israel would have been if they had simply followed those directions. Okay, do we dare to ask about our people in our time? Our church would probably be in the kingdom by now. In fact, Ellen White says so. If we all had studied our Bibles, the writings of Ellen White, especially under her understanding of the Great Controversy, spelled out so well in the Conflict of the Ages series, and had spread that news to all around us. We should have been in the kingdom a long time ago. Well, the Bible does not talk very much about schools or study or details about education. We know that there were some schools of the prophets which were started by Samuel and expanded by Elijah and Elisha, we know very little about them. What, do we, what can you think of? What comes to your mind when you think of the schools of the prophets? We well, had, uh, was it Elisha? Mm -hmm. Elijah. Of course, you had Samuel. Yeah. Uh, Elijah, wasn't he the one that was running in the rain or something? I'm getting that bit mixed up. Yeah, but I think especially the time they were trying to build a new dormitory and the guy, was, the, the head of his axe yeah, threw he off and so on. So that was Elisha, wasn't it? That was Elisha. Yeah, we just one of the stories. We know a few things, and and it, it talks particularly in Samuel's day. He kept rotating around between these things, these schools, to try to reach as many people and have as much influence as possible. So a few people, a few people were trying. And in the days of Elijah and Elisha, where did they work? In the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom? Do you remember? Southern, wasn't it? No. I think oh, you're yeah. up in the northern kingdom. They were in the northern kingdom. And Samuel, was uh, he, he wouldn't do all that good a job with his, with his sons, yeah. did he? Yeah, no. exactly. No. What we do know is that the Bible talks a lot about wisdom and about the wise. So maybe that has something to do about with, with, with education. Let me read to you. Here's an example, 2 Samuel 14, 2. So he sent for a clever woman who lived in Tekoa. When she arrived, he said to her, Pretend that you are in mourning. Put on your mourning clothes and don't comb your hair. Act like a woman who has been in mourning for a long time. Now, if you remember this story, this was a story of Absalom and oh, put his hair under. David. Yeah. Remember, he, when, when David found out that uh, everything would happen like this, Ab well, Absalom was trying to declare himself king. Thought he could, and then when he got beaten, he hung in. You know, he 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 hung himself at it, but and finally hung himself by his hair anyway. So, uh, but but God was. I mean, this woman was trying to get David to bring him back. Even before that, early in the story, and so she was considered to be very wise. And this is this is the thing she did when she was considered to be very wise. Proverbs 16, 23, intelligent people think that before they speak, what they say is then more persuasive. I like that. <laughs> and then we have 1 Kings 4, 29 to 34. What does this teach us about the importance of wisdom, Jim? First, as God gave Solomon unusual wisdom and insight and knowledge too great to be measured. Solomon was wiser than the wise men of the East or the wise men in Egypt. He was the wisest of all men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman the Calco and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread throughout all the neighboring countries. He composed 3,000 proverbs and more than 1,000 songs. He spoke of trees and plants from, from the Lebanon cedars to the hyssop that grows on walls. He talked about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Kings all over the world heard of his wisdom and sent people to listen to him. Good News Bible. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to ask you some question. How many of Solomon's Proverbs do we have? 
3,000. No, there was only, well, there's some, there, there's only, what, 31 chapters? It, yeah. How many of the, uh, the uh, different it, I've forgotten the exact figure, but it's about 500. Yeah. Where are the rest of them? We don't know. Is it possible that the others were not? In fact, even if you look at the chapter 25, um, you realize that Solomon didn't even put all of the all of the his proverbs in the proverbs. Hezekiah came along later and said, "There's some other good things that Solomon said. Get this. Let's gather some more stuff together." So chapters Proverbs 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 were supposedly sayings from Solomon, but they weren't put in the book of Proverbs until a long time later by Hezekiah and his friends. And then there's even more things. And what about, he had more than a thousand songs. How many of, how many of Solomon's songs do we have? Not very many of them, the Psalms. If we... <clears throat> we have two, maybe three. Mm. There's one Psalm that's from Solomon. There's a Song of Solomon it's a separate book, and there may be another one that might be from Solomon. So where did the other 997 go to? Well, he said more than a thousand, so... Uh, those those uh, uh, proverbs, many of those he collected from Egypt uh, wisdom. Uh, Various uh, other sources, yeah. yeah. And a fair number of them he modified a little bit to, to improve them. Right. So, well, so why do we have only just a small part of his wisdom? We don't know. Uh, were the ones we have, are they the best of, of the lot? Were, were some of the others not inspired? Or inspiring. Inspiring. It's important to notice also that even the books which are generally regarded as being from King Solomon include things which are not specifically written by him. Carrie? I've um, I'm going to be quoting... Proverbs 30, verse 1. These are the solemn words of Agur, son of Jakey. Hold on. These are whose words? That's what it's got here. I'm reading you what it is. Yeah, exactly. So this chapter was not from Solomon as far as we know, right? I don't know, but earlier, the reason I... You don't believe the word of God? <laughs> it says... No, well, I'm in a bit of a quandary because... When you're talking about how many proverbs is plainly listed here as 3,000, and you said no. No, it, if you count them in the book of Proverbs, there's a, I, it's 500 and some. I, I think okay. 538 or something like that. Where did the 3,000 come from? Well, that's, what, that was the, that's quoted from, from um, second, 1 Kings 4, verse 32. It just names it. It numbers them there. But it doesn't show you where you can find them. No, it doesn't tell you where you can find them. Okay. But now, I'm going to, let's just look at this. Proverbs 30, verse 1. I'm going to take you to the, to the actual place. Right there, you see, the words of Augur. Yeah. These are the solemn words of Augur, son of Jacob. God is not with men, da, da, da. So. Got any of that here. Yeah. Sounds a little bit like uh, Ecclesiastes. Yeah. And then look at the next one. Solemn, these are the solemn words which King Lemuel's mother said to him. That's Proverbs 31. Yeah. And who's King Lemuel? I don't know. Do we know? Uh, no, Somebody, some people have suggested maybe that was another name for Solomon. We don't know for sure. So if it was, if it was King Solomon, then his mother was who? Who is King Solomon's mother? No we idea. thought it was, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Bathsheba. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember. Okay. Well, the children of Israel were advised repeatedly about different methods they were to use in educating their children. You remember when you lie down, when you rise up, you know, those kinds of statements. Early to bed, early to rise. That's yeah, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> the youth were strongly encouraged to remember their creator in the days of their youth, Ecclesiastes 12.1. Yeah, Solomon recognized that when he was old and gray and toothless. And There are many bits of wisdom scattered through the Proverbs, including passages such as Proverbs 1.7. To have knowledge, you must first have reverence for the Lord. Stupid people have no respect for wisdom and refuse to learn. Wow. 
and Proverbs 6.68, a familiar passage. Lazy people should learn a lesson from the way ants live. They have no leader, chief, or ruler, but they store up their food during the summer getting ready for winter. And look at Jeremiah 18.18. 18. Then the Lord said, let's go, let's do something about Jeremiah. Then the people said, let's do something about Jeremiah. There will always be priests to instruct us, the wise to give us counsel, and prophets, uh, prophets to proclaim God's message. So priests, the wise, those will be the teachers, and prophets. And so um, this passage suggests that wise teachers were considered on an equality with priests and prophets in teaching the people. I hope that's true. It is interesting to observe that Christ's ministry on this earth lasted about three and one half years. Do you know how those years were divided up? Remember, he, he, he went down to, he was baptized in the fall by, by, by John the Baptist. The next six months was taken up, almost two months was taken up with him out in the wilderness. Then he traveled up to the, to the wedding festival and did some other things around Galilee. And then it was time for him to travel to his first major Passover. And he did some things there that angered the priests and the Pharisees. And then he spent the next year traveling around Judah, quietly under the radar, because he recognized if he was too vociferous and too public, he, they would be trying to arrest him right up there in front. He would never even get to finish the, you know, what he needed to do. Yeah. Then, the, then the next two years, the next year, when, when John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison, Jesus moved his ministry from Judah to Galilee. And the stories that we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are mostly from his experiences while in, in uh, Galilee the ne that next year. Then finally, the last year was divided in half. Uh, six months, he traveled completely outside of Judean territory and t taught his disciples. A special time to really focus on them. And then the last six months, he spent gathering a huge crowd, getting people following more and more. Sometime, some of the time he was over on the other side of Jordan, he collected all these people so that when he finally went up to Jerusalem in that final week of Passover, they couldn't arrest him and kill him and sort of in private. There would be too many people you know, everybody was there to see Jesus. And that's what he needed to show during those last six months. During that time, of course, the beginning of that time in Galilee, he chose his 12 disciples, and they, along with many others, followed him and learned from him. And I, one of my favorite places to talk about that is Luke 8, uh, and you really should start with verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons, demons had been written out, and, and we might add, had been taken in adultery a number of times. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer, officer in Herod's court. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Um, do you think of Jesus in his entourage as Jesus and 12 male disciples and a whole bunch of women. We normally don't think in those terms. <laughs> we, Nobody we, brings it to, to mind. Yeah. Wow. But Jesus recognized that there were still many things they needed to learn. Now they're, they're up there in that last Passover week, and Jesus says there's still a lot of things you need to learn. John 14, 16 to 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is a spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and it is in you. Wow. Paul also had some interesting things to say about education and its relationship to spreading the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, let me see if we can just pick up some of these verses real quick. When I came to you, my brothers and sisters, to preach God's secret truth, I did not use big words and great learning. 
Verse 6, I, Yet I did proclaim a message of wisdom to those who are spiritually mature, but it is not the wisdom that belongs to this world or to the power, um, hold on, or to the powers that are losing their war, losing their power. Powers that are losing their power. And then verses 10 and 11, But it was to this that God made known his secret by means of his spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the hidden depths of God's purposes. It is only the spirit within people that knows all about them. In the same way, only God's spirit knows all about God. So, it should be clear that Paul did not intend just for us to be beginners in understanding the plan of salvation. How often do we hear pastors preaching, we all need to be like children, you know, come and gather around Jesus. And of course they have the time when Jesus called that child to himself and they tend to think, oh well, if we could just be like children. But what did Paul say? We certainly should start with the story of Jesus with, about children, but that story goes deeper and deeper as we study it. Elsewhere, Paul taught us that we must not remain as children in our understanding of the truth. Carrie? Yes, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried okay, by... Let's the... interrupt for just a second. We're, we're to become mature people. We're not to be children any longer, right? Right. And what kind of... What, how do you describe these children? Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So, when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. From the Good News so, Bible. It's pretty clear that Paul intended for us to do what? Grow up, Grow right? Up, yes. Grow up and get be mature. He just specifically says mature. And if we had time, we would go over and read read some read uh, Hebrews five, starting with about verse fourteen up down to six, verse two or three, where he's writing to young men who are supposedly preparing himself preparing themselves to be missionaries, to be to be uh, you know to go out and, and spread the gospel. And he's saying, why are you so far behind? You still need milk. You're not ready to, to, to deal with, with the strong meat. Well, after he rose from the dead, on one of the occasions when he met with his remaining disciples, he gave that commission that we can read in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. This is familiar. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere, make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Teach them to obey everything I've commanded them, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Four things that they were supposed to do. The disciples were then to be apostles. That's the Greek word. Or missionaries, that's the Latin word. Those two words mean the same thing, those who are sent. So disciples means what? The word disciples means what? Remember? Remember? Learners. Learners yeah. Students. Yeah. Students, yeah. So when we talk about disciples, we're really talking about those who are under Jesus' direction and teaching. And then when we talk about apostles, this is now after Jesus is dead and gone and the disciples are scattered out to the world. Then they, But we, we often use apostles and disciples sort of interchangeably. We really should be a little more careful in saying, okay, if this is while they're still with Jesus, they're disciples. Later, when he's gone, they're apostles or missionaries. Okay. 
Um, so today, when people are led to accept the truth and choose to be baptized, there should, they should be, that should be just the starting point of their Christian education. They should be led through the Bible, book by book, learning the main principles taught in each book and in the Bible as a whole. So how many things are we supposed to learn from the Bible? And I might put in a plug for our website right now. If you go to our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G, you will find there study guides for every book of the Bible and what it's supposed to teach us about God. You'd find that very interesting. I sure did. Well, these are the things we're supposed to learn about from the Bible. Work, rest, social issues, community relations, church and worship, economics, philanthropy, relations with the authorities, counseling, family systems, marriage relations and child rearing, food and its preparation, clothing, even getting old and preparing for the end of life, both one's personal life and life in this world. To be a Christian means to learn something about all these things and more. Understanding them does not come naturally. It has to be learned. And how long is that learning supposed to go on? For an eternity. For an eternity, exactly. It's never supposed to stop. So what are we waiting for, right? Let's get started. Have you ever thought of reading the Bible from the perspective of the student-teacher relationship? Do you pray daily for the divine teacher to guide you and teach you? Well, back in the beginning, when he, when he created us in his image, was it God's plan that we should learn to think his thoughts along with him as we gain that most valuable education? Don't you wish you could have heard some of those lessons that, that God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned? What do you suppose he taught them? Was he talking about the birds and the bees and the trees and the flowers and the fruits and so forth? Probably some of that. Yeah. What else might he have been talking about? Well, we know that the angels and God warned them strictly about Satan, what Satan had done, what, was, what had happened in heaven and so forth. They knew that story. Wow. And they fell for a talking... Snake. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> From the point where Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and God gave them that promise in Genesis 3.15, God's plan for restoration and redemption has been key to his relationship with human beings. How successful has God been? Does our world today seem to be getting closer and closer to God's ideal? I'll let you think about that. <laughs> <laughs> For example, a Christian may want to, be, to witness by sharing a favorite Bible verse with a college friend, but soon realizes that the friend sees the Bible as a compilation of myths with zero credibility. Now what? When the Christian skips the Bible and goes straight to explaining how God sent Jesus to die for our sins, he or she is met with a disdainful look over the word sin. Sin, the friend smirks. Sin is an outdated concept from the days when religion was control, when religion controlled society. We've moved into, excuse me, we've moved beyond objective morality. In other words, what may be a, a sin for you may be a virtue in another creature, culture. In, in culture. The Christian struggles to look unperturbed and as a last-ditch effort says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that salvation can be found in him if you believe. The friend patronizingly pats the Christian on the shoulder and remarks that the postmodern studies have shown that the term truth is problematic and is a throwback to the era of modernity. Era of modernity. The friend expresses contentment that the Christian has found a path that brings him peace, but that he or she is on a different uh, is on a different one. They part ways, and the Christian is left wondering why that whole witnessing opportunity didn't go 
the way it was supposed to go, or it was supposed to, a Bible study guide. Wow. Now, earlier on in, in that passage, it says, Jesus died, uh, that Jesus died for your sins. Now, that's really not true. He died because of sin. He died of yeah. sinful people. But Jesus didn't die for your sins. I mean, that's that's a kind of a get out of jail free type of card. Does anybody learn anything with with that process? Not hardly. Well, boy, I'm afraid that if you ran across a person with that kind of an attitude, yes. you wouldn't get very far. No, no. So how are we supposed to prepare ourselves for a response like that? The first step always should be to pray for wisdom on our part and for understanding on our friend's part. Do we also need to delve into the academic literature of philosophy, the biblical and social, systematic theology, history, faith, science studies, and other disciplines to prepare ourselves for meeting our friend's skeptical concerns? What should be our approach? It would be easy to just decide to tell them about Jesus, and if they do not accept it, give up on them. But that does seem like a cop-out, right? Well, J.P. Morgan's book, Love Your God and With All Your Mind, page 58, he suggests the following. One, there is a false and prideful use of reason that is not conducive to spreading the gospel. Reason itself, and quote, wisdom from above, unquote, cannot be under condemnation, but only its abuse. It is hubris, pride, that is in view, not now, mind. God chose foolish, and in brackets it says Moriah. That's a Greek, Moriah. Okay, things that were offensive to human pride, not to reason properly used. For example, the idea of God being crucified was so offensive that the Greek spirit would have judged it to be morally disgusting. Two, Paul also could have used, used have the use of Greek rhetoric in mind. Greek orators prided themselves on being able to argue persuasively any side of an issue from the right for the right price. The truth of a matter of a matter becomes secondary in this context, and the prize goes to whoever gives the slickest, most polished speech. Does that sound like anything that happens today? Yeah. Paul may well want to distance himself from those methods. Paul also may be arguing for the insufficiency of pure re reason alone to communicate the gospel. It is not possible first to begin with principles of logic and deduction and somehow arrive at a crucified and risen divine savior, revelation, apostolic, prophetic testimony. The draw of the Holy Spirit and faith are necessary components in conjunction with reason to make the move from unbelief to a commitment to Christ. Wow. So, what are we saying here? You, you can't just logically figure out the plan of salvation. This is a revelation. It has to come from God. You have to accept His words from there. And, you, the, the, you, the, we, you know, it, it requires a certain amount of humility to say, well, we, we can't just figure this out on our own. We, we, we depend on God to tell us. But if we study Paul in a little more detail, we come across sections of his writings, for example, Romans 1 to 12, where we discover a very carefully crafted and profoundly brilliant theological treatise. Then, should Adventists avoid higher education and just spend our time reading the Bible, the writings of Ellen White, and asking the Holy Spirit to guide us? I remember in my days back in college, uh, almost, well, just as we were about finishing my first year, one of my classmates said, uh, this is too much trouble. I'm going to go. I'm going to study the Bible, study da da da, and he ended up leaving the church completely and going off. Yeah. You know, he thought he was, you know, had too many important things to do to bother with going through all that education. Um, we should not forget a couple of pieces of advice: one from Peter and the other from C.S. Lewis. Gary, I think. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, let me interrupt there. Okay, could that student who had that character he was trying to talk to, did, did, could he have made any difference by 
giving a better answer and meekness and fear. I mean, it looks like he was using more or less reasonable things that he was trying to say to that man. Um, it's pretty tough to get through to people that are had their mind made up, and they, and they haven't, and especially if they've. I'm just observing the, with uh, young people today. Uh, somebody, you know, they they live in a, in a home that uh, the thing is. I will I will tell you a very quick story. I knew a man who, as a teenager, had a conversation with a professor from a university, professor of the history of science. And they were arguing back and forth, evolution versus Christian understanding of the Bible. And they were, they were just going, they're back and forth, and they and arguing about what happened back in the beginning. They, nobody knew. Finally, the young man said to him, he said, well, look, we don't know anything about that end of history. You, you won't admit my version, I won't admit your version. Let's come to this end of history. Suppose you believe that you know, whoever's the strongest and most powerful has can just take whatever what he wants and so forth. This survival, the fittest things. How would you like to live in a world like that? And the professor just sat there for a moment and they said, "You got me." Yeah. That sounded like a story that Richard Nice told. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Carrie. If all the world were Christian, it might not matter if all the world were educated. But a cultural life will exist outside the church, whether it exists inside or not. Good philosophy must exist, exist rather, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, Lewis. I love the idea. When looking at the Gospels and the life and ministry of Jesus and also the letters of Paul, it is important to notice that there's a lot of practical as well as theoretical advice in places like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Paul's letter to the Romans, and are there things in those passages that we still need to learn? If Jesus were here in person, I want you to think about this. If Jesus were here in person in our day, what do you think he would want us to learn as most important? Don't, be, so, don't be self-centered. Don't be self-centered. Well, that's a great start. What would he say to us about the life of Christ? I and mean, he talked so much about Christ, he never met him as far as we know. Uh, whatever. So I'll put that to you. What would you think Paul or Jesus would want to talk about most of all if they were here in our world today? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to have opened before us these re re reliable records of what happened so long ago and things that we can learn and should learn from them. May we not be drawn a aside from, our, from the truth by those who want to come with all sorts of other arguments is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.